our ancient ancestors had access to some pretty incredible technology. In fact, their technology was so incredible that we can't adequately explain how they came up with it. Scientists don't like to talk about it, but you can find evidence of this high technology everywhere if you know where to look. Fortunately, we do, and we'll share it with you in this video. Some archaeologists and historians claim that the Nimrod lens is the world's first telescope. Others say that it was never designed for such a function and that its magnification properties were used to magnify the sun's rays and start fires rather than gaze at distant objects or stars. Who's right and who's wrong? Well, the debate has been ongoing for well over a century and doesn't seem likely to end anytime soon. The artifact, which is also known as the Layered Lens, was discovered in the ruins of an Assyrian palace in Iraq in 1850. It started life as a humble chunk of rock crystal, but was cut, shaped, and polished until it came into its current shape. The Nimrod Lens is capable of magnifying an object by a factor of three, which might not sound like a lot, but that's the same magnification factor as the telescope that was invented in the Netherlands in 1608. The Nimrod lens was already about 2,600 years old when that Dutch telescope was invented, so it's no exaggeration to say that if the lens really was intended to be a telescope, it was thousands of years ahead of its time. The Lycurgus Cup is an ancient Roman artifact that perfectly demonstrates the capabilities of nanotechnology. That's a field of science we're still just beginning to explore today, but here's the work of an ancient Roman craftsman who knew at least something about it 1,600 years ago. The cup changes color depending on which angle you look at it from. From one direction, it's red, but walk around it and you'll see it turn green. That stunning optical illusion is all down to microscopically small particles of silver and gold that were added to the glass mixture. Each particle is a mere 50 nanometers in diameter, invisible to the naked eye. To give you an idea of scale, the particles are 1,000 times smaller than a grain of salt. There's no way the gold and silver got into the mix accidentally, so whoever made the Lycurgus Cup knew what they were doing. And we have no idea how. It looks like they kept their secrets close to their chest, though, because nothing like this artifact has ever been found in any former Roman territory. It's an utterly unique item. The Iron Pillar of Delhi was created more than 1,500 years ago. You'd never guess that by looking at it, though, because there isn't a trace of rust on it. That isn't because it's regularly cleaned and polished, it's because it's physically impossible for the pillar to rust. The Iron Column, which is sometimes called the Ashaki Pillar, stands 22 feet tall. Every inch of those 22 feet is coated in a rust-proof substance called Misa White which prevents the surface of the iron from being exposed to oxygen. Without that contact, rust can occur. It's so difficult to imagine that the people who made the pillar all that time ago knew how to prevent rusting that most scientists think it was probably an accident. Their best guess is that the misawite formed under freakish, one-off conditions as the hot iron mixed with lime, slag, and damp air while it cooled. Once it became apparent that their pillar was never going to rust, the ancient residents of Delhi looked upon it as a miracle. The idea that this was a happy accident is backed up by the fact that no other rust-proof Indian objects from this era have ever been found. Although the religions of Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism differ from each other, they share some key beliefs. One of them is that the Vajra is the chosen weapon of the gods. You'll find mentions of Vajra going back as far as the Rig Veda, the first part of the four known Vedas. From an entomological point of view, there are two ways we can understand the word Vajra, both of which come from Sanskrit. The first is as lightning, and the second is as diamond. In both instances, it's thought the intention of the word is to represent the weapon as an irresistible force. According to mythology, Indra was told directly by Vishnu that a weapon made from the bones of the Hindu sage Dadichi would be capable of destroying the serpent demon known as Vritra. The weapon in question was created by the divine artisan Foster and proved to be successful. 
Indian traditions hold the Vajra as the most powerful weapon in the universe. That's a bold claim for a weapon that's basically a club with a ribbed head, but there's no shortage of people who believe in it. The Antikythera mechanism is one of the best known archaeological relics in the world. The 2100-year-old object, which was salvaged from a Roman shipwreck, is said to be so sophisticated as a means of calculating astronomical changes that it ought to be considered the ancestor of the modern computer. Archaeologists returned to the same wreck in October 2017 and found another precious artifact, a bronze disc of around the same shape and size as the Antikythera mechanism, but of a totally different design. They initially hoped that the disc might be a part of the mechanism, but when they x-rayed it, they found that beneath the hardened layer of sediment that coats the artifact is a detailed depiction of a bull. This, plus the four perforations at the edges of the disc, suggests that it was a decorative object that was once secured to a wall. It's an interesting find, but it wasn't the breakthrough discovery that would explain the Antikythera mechanism that they were hoping for. Without that breakthrough, we still don't know why no other artifact like the Antikythera mechanism has ever been found. You're probably familiar with the basic design of a sundial, but it's highly unlikely that you've ever seen a sundial that looks like the globe of Metallica before. As the name implies, this is an ancient Roman-style sundial sculpted into the side of a ball made from solid marble. It's been considered something of an archaeological mystery ever since it was found during the reconstruction of the Palazzo Pretorio in March, Italy in 1985. The globe is almost exactly one foot in diameter and is made from marble that was extracted from somewhere near Ephesus in Turkey. Scientists think it was carved in either the 1st or 2nd century. Unfortunately, the original inscriptions have been damaged and only a few words and letters of ancient Greek are still visible on the surface of the device. That makes it impossible to confirm a long-standing theory that aside from functioning as a sundial, the globe of Metallica might also have been used in astronomical calculations, much like in our millery sphere. It's likely that the 13 holes in the surface of the sphere once contained metallic insertions to indicate the hour of the day thus allowing observers to tell the time. Speaking of devices that tell the time, the most popular way of doing so in China and India prior to the invention of the modern day clock was the incense clock. There's a lot of disagreement between experts about who invented the incense clock and when. We know that it was popular in China by the time of the Song Dynasty in the 10th century and spread from China to Korea and Japan but the history of the device can be traced back to the 8th century in India. Some sources indicate that the Indians actually got the idea from Chinese inventors who came up with the first incense clock in the 6th century, but the reliability of those sources is where the debate comes from. In basic terms, each incense clock holds either an incense stick or incense powder that's been carefully manufactured to burn at a very specific speed. As such, it's possible to work out what day it is or how much time has passed by checking how much of the stick or the powder inside the clock is burned. More advanced models contain gongs and bells, which would automatically ring to indicate the passing of an hour or a day. The first recorded democracy in the history of the world was that of ancient Greece. The Greeks went to great lengths to ensure that their democracy was fair which is why devices like the Clerotarion were invented. The device was used to ensure favoritism couldn't creep into processes like creating councils, selecting juries, and other important social and political functions in Athens. In form, the Clerotarion is a little more than a stone slab incised with hundreds of slots and attached to a tube. Tokens would be placed into the slots and were then randomly released into the pipe. However, there's a catch. The mechanism that released the tokens has not survived in any of the Clerotorian units that have survived to the present day, so we're not sure how the process worked. We assume that it was something akin to a long nail to block the open end and separate one falling token from another, but we can't prove it. 
Historical records suggest that the first claritarion was invented in the year 403 BCE, after citizens expressed discontent with the first-come, first-served method of forming councils in Athens. Okay, we accept that our next piece of technology isn't truly ancient, but it's an important step in the evolution of mathematics. It's called the arithmometer, and it's the world's first ever digital mechanical calculator. They were small and durable enough to be used in office environments and were the most reliable means of performing calculations until someone came up with the pocket calculator. The device, which was patented in France by Thomas de Colmar in 1820, was capable of addition, subtraction, division, and long multiplication. The peak years of the device's popularity were between 1851 and 1915, but such was their popularity that they were still manufactured until the 1970s. The big advantage of the device from the perspective of employers was that it was easy to use, so a unit could be given to an employee without the need for any special training. As time went on and people found themselves needing to calculate larger numbers with more decimal places, bigger versions of the arithmometer were created. The largest known version was built in 1875 and ran to 20 digits. The people of the time probably couldn't envision a reason why anybody would ever need to be able to calculate bigger numbers. We suspect most people have never heard of Francesco Lana de Terzi, which is a shame. He's a 17th century Italian inventor, mathematician, and naturalist, and in 1670, he came up with a stunning design for a vehicle he referred to as the flying boat. The design has quite a few things in common with a conventional boat. For example, there's a central mast attached to a sail and a steering system designed to work exactly like that of a sailboat. However, attached to the four masts would be copper spheres made of very thin foil and pumped to vacuum conditions, thus making them lighter than the air that surrounded them. In the inventor's mind, that would make them capable of carrying the vessel and up to six passengers into the sky. Terzi dreamed of building a prototype to test his theory, but unfortunately for him, nobody in his lifetime was capable of making copper foil so thin. Later in his life, he expressed his hope that no flying machines would ever be made, as he feared they would be used to bombard cities from above. He wasn't wrong. Question: How did our ancient ancestors bore precise holes into solid rock? Answer using devices like the bow drill. A standard bow drill doesn't look like a powerful tool. It's a basic hand-operated tool made of a spindle and a shaft set into motion by pushing a bow back and forth. The bow is attached to a taut piece of cord, which is in turn wrapped around the spindle. The invention is sometimes known as the Egyptian bow drill, owing to a belief that it's an ancient Egyptian invention. But solid evidence to support that theory is scant. Instead, it's more likely that bow drills were invented in Megar, Pakistan, somewhere between 6 and 7,000 years ago. Examples of bow drills made with green jasper drill bits have been recovered from the archaeological site there. However, ancient bow drills have also been found in lands formerly occupied by the Indus Valley Civilization, making it hard to say whether the concept began in one area before moving to another or whether the invention is an example of a parallel evolution. We'd like to end with an invention that proves that not all innovative ideas are great ones. It's Lawson's vaginal washer. And regrettably, it's exactly what it appears to be. If you're a Doctor Who fan and you're looking at this ridiculous advice and thinking that it looks exactly like a Dalek gun, you're not the first person to make that association. Lawson, whose first name has been lost to time, came up with this idea in 1900. You'd like to think that we'd learned enough about feminine hygiene by then to realize this wasn't a great idea, but apparently not. The idea behind the device is as simple as it is stupid. It's inserted into the vagina and then pumps out a jet of water before rotating like a squeegee, theoretically cleaning the inside of the organ as it does so. In doing so, it ignores the fact that the organ in question is self-cleaning by design. 
It also ignores medical advice that putting anything up there of this size that rotates and ejects water as a forceful stream is a fairly terrible idea. Unsurprisingly, it was invented by a man. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.